Hello, and welcome to another edition of Active Living. We are very, very have a very special guest today. We have Alyssa Slotkin. Alyssa is running for the House of Representatives in the United States, uh, and she is running in the 8th District. So welcome to our little program. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to have you here. And we're going to be talking a little bit today about your background. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to hear a little bit more about where you grew up yep. and a little bit about what your background is that makes you qualified to be a U.S. representative. Sure. So um, I'm a third generation Michigander um, and I grew up here in Oakland County. My early life, my elementary school life was um, largely in Holly, Michigan. I live uh, just down the road now in Holly. We had a family farm there. Um, my company, my family has a, had a meat company okay. called High Grade Foods in downtown Detroit. Um, and so we're all in the meat business. And High Grade, um, you know, did all the meat for Nathan's Hot Dogs. Okay. We invented the ballpark Frank at Tiger Stadium. Whoa. So we're, we're hot dog people. <laughs> we're hot dog people. And uh, my grandfather drove up Dixie Highway and uh, bought a farm in Holly in 1956. And that's sort of the Slotkin family home. So um, that's where I live and um, uh, lived all around Oakland County. My parents divorced and I lived all around Oakland County. But my entire professional experience is in international affairs and national security. Okay. And that's largely because of 9-11. Um, mm -hmm. I was in my second day of graduate school in New York City when 9-11 happened. And when the smoke cleared and you know the F-16s cleared out of the airspace, I really knew that I was going to dedicate my life to national service. Fantastic. Um, so within a year, I was recruited into the CIA. Uh, I was a CIA analyst on the Middle East. And within a year of that, I was voluntold to go to Iraq, <laughs> as we say in military circles. You're yeah, right. Yeah. Never volunteer, right? That's right. I was voluntold <laughs> to go to Iraq. Um, I uh, you know, was trained weapons qualified and wore my body armor and traveled around with the military helping to map the organizations that were shooting at U.S. forces. What in the world did you do, though, as a CIA person in, yeah. in Iraq? Do yeah. you, you just kind of like come up with an overall plan to uh, how you're going to defeat the enemy? So my specific responsibility was looking at the militias and the terrorist groups that were shooting at U.S. forces okay. and Iraqi forces. And so you, you, most CIA analysts are, are um, looking in the field are looking at who are the leaders, who are mm -hmm. the money men, where are they getting their weapons and materiel, right. um, how are they supporting themselves, who's, who's in charge of propaganda, and mapping those organizations so that we can have a better chance of protecting U.S. forces. Okay. So that's what I was doing. That sounds interesting. Now, were it's you in the green zone when you were there? So I um, uh, slept in the evenings in the green zone, but then would, be go, would go out during the day outside the green zone. Um, I would spend sometimes six weeks up north in northern Iraq. I would spend three weeks in southern Iraq, wherever they needed me. And we needed to better understand these groups to protect U.S. forces in the U.S. homeland. So you were in a situation where you could be under fire. Yes, I mean, the, the, the Green Zone um, and U.S. forces in general were taking significant rocket and mortar fire on a regular basis really? when I was there. Yes. Oh, <laughs> sounds well, exciting. <laughs> well, exciting. A lot of a lot of um, men and women lost their lives right, based on that um, on that indirect fire, and and IEDs on the road became a huge problem, a huge risk for us. Mm -hmm. So, um, yes. So that's. then, you, from there, you went to Washington D.C. So in between those, I did three tours in Iraq. Tour. Okay. So I would go for nine months. I would come back. I would go. I would come back. Um, and in between those tours, I was working in national security organizations like the Director for National Intelligence. Right. I was working at the White House mm -hmm. and then at the Pentagon, um, the last five years of the Pentagon. And I think something that's maybe a little bit different for a candidate is that I worked very much for both Republicans and Democrats. Cool. My experience is very bipartisan. National security is about focusing on the mission of protecting U.S. forces right. and protecting the U.S. homeland. You know, I did three tours in Iraq, and no one ever asked me if I was a Democrat or a Republican. So I think we need a little bit more of that spirit in our domestic politics. Well, we certainly do, that's for sure. Yeah. And hopefully it's starting to happen, but you never know. You yeah. get the far right and the far left. Anyway, so why, and after all of this, you know, experience that you have, did you finally decide that you're going to go after this this uh, this this job here? Yeah. So. Um, 
I, I'm from a service family. So my husband, I met on my third tour in Iraq. Right. He's a career army officer. Uh, he retired as a colonel. It was mm -hmm. an Apache pilot. Um, my stepdaughter, one of my stepdaughters is a brand new army officer and the other one is a brand new physician at the VA. So we're a service family. Okay. And we just looked at the tenor and tone of politics over the past year and a half. Um, we looked at the congressmen and women on both sides of the aisle and we just felt very firmly that these people have forgotten that they are public servants first. That their primary job is to represent the people that elected them and we just felt like people had forgotten that job, that that's their responsibility. You mean you, you feel that they are kind of catering towards large corporations? Uh, certainly um, there is a sense of selfishness in Washington um, and a lot of it comes from the corporate so sponsorship of many of these folks. Again, on both sides of the aisle, right. um, corporate political action committees spend enormous amounts of money um, paying for our politicians and our politicians take that money um, and uh, obviously then become beholden to the companies that provided that support. And right. I, think, um, I think that that is uh, a questionable thing. And so I made the announcement last week that I will not be accepting corporate PAC donations to my campaign. Really? Yes, that was a, an important thing for me. I don't want there to be any um, confusion about um, someone owning my vote, who mm -hmm. I'm beholden to, um, I'm, I'm running because I want to work for people, not because I'm bought and sold by corporations. Fantastic. Yeah. It sounds a little bit like Bernie Sanders approach. Well, you know, I think, <laughs> I think um, you know, the, it, is, it is a very complicated thing um, to try and run a campaign with integrity, but it is still possible. It's got to be expensive, though. I mean, just to, just to run for an office like you're running for, I mean, I, I can't put a number on it, but I'm sure you could probably put an imaginary or... A, a, a target number yeah. on what it's going to cost you to, to, to run for this office. Yeah, so I had never been involved in politics. I was a career civil servant, so I didn't know how much it cost right. to run for office. But just by way of example, for money in politics, um, our current representative um, spent $2.5 million last cycle to win this seat. Really? So um, th that gives you the order of magnitude of what we're talking about here, which I was, my husband and I were just shocked. We, we couldn't believe that one seat, um, that you know, people would be raising that kind of money, but that's, and, that's and for what that, did. And for that amount of money that you spend to get this job, how much does the job pay? Uh, you know, the salary, <laughs> listen. It, the, it's it, not much, yeah. right? When, certainly when you're campaigning, you know, like you do not receive a salary. Right. Yes. Right. So, um, but money in politics is as insidious as you would imagine. Right. Yeah. Well, this program is all about senior citizens. Yeah. And one of the things that we're obviously concerned about is health care. Mm -hmm. uh, the cost of health care keeps rising and rising and rising every year. Uh, I know of people that have retired at 56, 57 years old. Yeah. They can't get on Medicare until they're 65 or older. Yeah. And what happens is the cost of, of health insurance is out of sight. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about fifteen, eighteen thousand dollars yeah, a year. I know this and a lot of people well. don't even make that a year. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Obamacare hopefully addressed some of that by giving some some help to uh, lower uh, lower uh, earning type people. Mm -hmm. But what what kind of uh, situation do you view uh, in the future for health care? Yeah. Because it just keeps getting more and more expensive. It does. And I know you had an experience with your mom. Yeah, I think I think um, I come at this from a very personal place, right? right. I, the thing that finally got me into this race was that vote to repeal Obamacare without a replacement. Okay. Um, when I watched our current representative vote for that, um, because for me, health care um, is extremely close to home. Uh, my mother died in 2011 of ovarian cancer, and she had struggled with health care her entire life. Mm -hmm. um, when she was diagnosed, she had let her health care lapse, and she did not have health care. Oh. Um, she had a breast cancer as a very young woman at 31 when I was a little girl. Right. Um, and when she lost her job here in Michigan in Oakland County in 2002, she lost her health insurance. Right. And because she had breast cancer when she was a young woman, she could not get health care that she could afford because she had what we now call a pre-existing condition. Right. So she went for five and a half years without health care. So five and a half years without a gynecological exam, a checkup, without a doctor saying, you know, you had cancer as a young woman, right. you should really check yourself more often. Mm -hmm. um, finally, in 2008, my brother and I helped her get insurance. Um, it was $1,000 a month. Oh. It was her yeah. highest bill, yeah. higher than her rent, higher right. than her car payment, 
but she had it because you got to have health insurance, right? Exactly. A lot, you, 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 you got to. Um, so she had it. And in July of 2009, without us knowing, she let it lapse. Oh. And in September of 2009, she was diagnosed with stage four ovarian cancer. So I'm sure many of your viewers have had that experience of having a loved one get a terminal diagnosis, right? right? Your life just explodes. Mm -hmm. um, and we um, had that experience, like so many people in this area, in Michigan, where they had her on an MRI gurney, right? Um, and they would not wheel her in until we wrote an $8,000 check. Wow. And they would not put a needle in her arm for emergency blood work until we charged a $12,000 bill. Wow. Um, so we went on like that because what do you do? They have yeah. you over a barrel, exactly. right? It's your mother. Exactly. So you're just writing, writing checks. checks. We were preparing for her to declare bankruptcy. And in this area, one out of every five bankruptcies was related to a medical emergency before, right. before Obamacare. Um, and um, through a total loophole, we got her back on insurance. She had been off for 42 days, and you can legally get back on if it's been under 45 days. Wow. So a three-day, <laughs> and no one should have to get health care because of a loophole, right. right? So when I watched our current representative, Mike Bishop, um, stand in the front row of the Rose Garden ceremony in May of 2017, proud and beaming and thrilled that he had voted to repeal Obamacare without a replacement, right. that was it. For, for me. Um, and listen, Obamacare needs reform. Just like Social Security sure. legislation needed a few times until mm -hmm. it came to be something that worked for our right. country. So it desperately needs reform. But um, he, he did that without a town hall. You know, he voted, he took that vote without a true public forum, a meeting with seniors, a right. meeting with doctors and nurses, just to understand the implications of his vote. Um, and so my husband and I looked at each other and we said, um, We've seen this before. This is dereliction of duty. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you don't get to be elected by a group of people and then vote against their interests and keep your job. So cool. we decided to fire him. <laughs> well, there's another issue, issue that's actually coming up now yes. with, the, with the changes that have just been made. Uh, they've, they've taken away the requirement for younger people to, uh, to insure themselves. Yes. So what's going to happen, as I view it, I don't yeah. know how you view it, but as I view it, what happens is all the younger, healthy people are going to drop out of the plan, yeah. and guess who's going to get stuck with all the high bills? Right. The seniors. So, you know, this is why it really matters who you send to Washington, because we saw May and through the summer many attempts to legislate changes, major changes to our health care system. Right. And when those wouldn't work, we had a group of congressmen who have turned to sabotage, right? Mm -hmm. They're going to try and chip away at our health care right. through a tax bill, right? Mm -hmm. What you're talking about right. came in quietly under the radar in a tax bill. Right. Um, and I do not believe in making policy ever by sabotage, but you're very right. By taking the young people, the mandate for young people to be in the system, uh, by taking that away, it will, it will result in an increase in premiums for most people. Right. Well, especially the, 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 the seniors. Yeah. Now, the other, the other issue that, that always comes to mind when you're talking about seniors in health care is the cost of drugs. Yes. And here we are, the largest drug consumer in the country, which is the federal government, mm -hmm. and there is no negotiation with any of the drug companies. So this one is a real easy one for me because I'm on military insurance, right? My husband's right. a military officer, or retired military officer, um, and um, the VA is allowed to negotiate yes. to buy drugs in bulk. You're absolutely right. Medicare, you are not, right? right. Medicare is not allowed. This is something that could change tomorrow. Right. if we wanted it to change. So if my dad, who's on Medicare, if my dad gets an infection in his toe and I get the same infection in my toe, mm -hmm. and we both just go get our amoxicillin prescription right. at the pharmacy, he will pay double often what I pay. Right. Um, there is no good reason for that. And uh, one of the things I would work on first and foremost if elected was pushing to have Medicare allow, uh, allowed to buy drugs in bulk. Right. It's just simple common sense. But there's a lot of money flowing in the That's other right. direction. That's right. Which says, uh, you know, you you got to you got to vote this way because I gave you X amount of dollars. That's right. Well, that's why I made it really really clear that I'm not going to take money from these companies. Cool. Um, unlike my opponent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's really a uh, interesting uh, approach, and I think it's the right approach. Yeah. I don't think we ought to have, you know, w when they made the, the I can't remember the name of the the bill or the uh, the, the ruling by the. Uh, 
by the uh, uh, courts where corporations basically became people. Yeah, Citizens I mean, United. Citizens mm -hmm. United. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, uh, we, we've got all, all this money flowing around yeah. and, it, it, and they're buying votes, basically. Yeah. Um, are there any other issues relating to seniors that you would like to comment on? Sure. Well, I think um, on the prescription drug issue, so yes, allowing Medicare to buy in bulk, but the other thing is protecting against predatory price increases. Right? Mm -hmm. Everyone remembers the EpiPen lady, yes. right? the lady who just jacked up the price of the EpiPen because she wanted to increase her profit margins. Right. Um, we see drug companies do that all the time. Right now, the one I'm hearing about the most is insulin. There's been a predatory price increase in right. insulin, and there's no generic alternative. Right. So you mm -hmm. have people over a barrel. So one of the things that I would do if elected is um, I would just add a bit more um, uh, transparency into the predatory price increases. Right. If a drug company wants to increase their prices more than 10% in one year, that's fine. But just open your books and show that it's for research and development, not more Super Bowl commercials, right? right? Prescription right. drugs are not widgets. It's people's lives that they have in their hands. So right. um, additional transparency on drug pricing is something I would work on, I think would deeply affect seniors. The other, the other issue that you always hear about with seniors is Social Security. Mm -hmm. And you know, I know there's been efforts in the past by the, by the other party to uh, privatize part of it so that you can invest part of your uh, Social Security into the market, for example, yeah. those types of things. Uh, do you have any kind of position on what should happen with Social Security? Yeah, I think Social Security was one of the most popular and important programs we have in our country. Mm -hmm. There is, um, uh, people depend on it, people pay their whole lives into that system. They work hard and they deserve that at the, um, in their retirement. And for me, I just don't believe that private companies should be doing inherently governmental action. Now yeah. that can be for managing our systems like Social Security, that can be performing military functions. Mm -hmm. I think there are some functions that inherently belong um, to the government, and as long as it's being executed well, that it should stay in the hands of the government as opposed to privatizing large sections of these things. Um, and my fear is that um, with some of the spending that's gone on lately, you know, Spending at our national budget for our national budget is like a it's like a home budget, right? You can spend wildly during Christmas time, but the bill will come due, and you're going to have to pay that bill. Um, and uh, I'm concerned that some of our programs, like Medicare and Social Security, are going to be looked at as the bill payer for some of the big spending we saw at the in December at the tax bill. It seems to me that there could be a fairly easy fix on Social Security, and that would be taking the cap off the earnings. Uh, Social Security, you get taxed uh, 7% or something like that, up to a certain point, it's like 120 or $30,000. Yeah. But after that, you don't pay any more Social Security. Mm. So what we end up with is a, is a uh, situation where a low earner will be paying more than a millionaire in terms of percentage towards Social Security. Yeah. See, I think programs like these or ideas like these are extremely possible if you have people who just focus on getting things done instead of grandstanding, instead of kind of turning to the media. There are lots of ways that we can address real problems today if you had Democrats and Republicans just willing to actually sit together and work on these issues. So I, I, I absolutely think these proposals and others that folks have brought up to my attention are possible, but you got to have people who are willing to sit in a room together and get right. things done. We're starting to see a little of that in the Senate, That's but I right. don't see any of that in the House of Representatives. Yeah, we've had a dearth of that, I would say, um, in the House. and. That's why I think, you know, the Washington is not going to change itself, right? People are not going to reform <laughs> themselves. We have to change who we send in order to change the culture there. Now, what do you think about uh, this, this uh, women's movement? Mm -hmm. I mean, we've had, I was in California earlier this week, and I think there were 500,000 women yeah, very big. that marched in, in San Francisco yeah. alone. Yep, yep. Do you see a movement more towards uh, leveling the pay playing field? I, th I certainly think we're going through sort of a generational moment right now okay. on women's issues, certainly when it comes to issues of harassment, sexual assault, right. reporting those things, having a fair and transparent process so that women can be heard on those issues. You know, I'm someone who's worked in almost exclusively male-dominated fields my whole life, right. right? The CIA, the Defense Department, alongside the military in Iraq. Um, so I certainly saw how the playing field is not quite, um, uh, you know, 50-50 at right. this point. So I think it's good. We are a country of pendulum swings. 
Um, and uh, I think it's what's going on right now is a really important moment. It's great for our young women, right? right? So they'll never have to experience some of the things that some of our, our oldest women in the workforce have experienced. And I think that's a great thing. And, and I feel it on the ground. I mean, the women volunteers on our campaign are some of our most powerful and capable members. Right. Yeah. And I, I don't know if you saw the uh, front page of Time Magazine. Yes. Time Magazine had a, had a whole cover full yeah. of women who have decided to run for office yep. like yourself. Yes. I mean, there's been sort of, I think it's a 10 or 20 fold increase yeah. in the number of women running. And I think that's great. And I think, um, you know, a lot of women will say to me, listen, I haven't really voted uh, for your party before, but I believe in electing women because the lack of civility in Washington, mm -hmm. I believe women will have a better shot at making Washington more civil. Now, I've met some uncivil women in my <laughs> life, um, but I, I think that there is an overall feeling on all sides of the political spectrum, Republican, independent, Democrat, uh, that the tone and tenor needs to change in Washington and women can help with that. Oh, that's great. Yeah. All right. Well, our t is it, before we close up, yes. is there anything else that you'd like to talk about? Yeah. So I think, you know, I believe no matter where people fall on the political spectrum, this is we're just in a time in our history where we need to be demanding more of our public servants. Okay. Right. We need to expect more. Right. It's no longer good enough to say, well, does he vote the right way? Does he show up every so often? We should be saying, are these people going to fight for us, right? right? What are they going to do with that time? Are they just going to take the title and enjoy their corporate sponsorship or are they going to actually work for us? So we have to we have to raise our expectations mm -hmm. on people. And I want to earn people's vote, right? We, people right. have been taken for granted in this part of Michigan for a long, long time. So I hope um, one of the things I can do is meet some of your viewers and um, I, I want to earn people's vote and show them that they deserve more than what they have. All right. Well, we'll put on the screen when we, when we do the final editing yep. uh, any uh, information regarding where they can contact that you. That would be great. And uh, if they want to send a donation, yeah. obviously, you'd like to see That'd that That'd be great, too. but volunteers. Um, we just had our first volunteer kickoff right here near in Clarkston. Oh, yeah. Um, and we're having another one in Brighton, another one in Lansing, and soon one in Rochester. We'll have offices up and running. Um, soon enough by early spring. So if there's folks who have extra time on their hands and they want to volunteer a few hours a week, we're ready for them. Great. Okay. Okay. Well, thank great. you very much for thank joining you. us today. Appreciate it. It's, it's been, been great. great. Uh, so we'll see you the next time.